Um, I'm very happy to be here, especially since um, it appears that whoever was responsible for selecting the topic of this lecture had a broad range of topics to choose from. And this one in particular, uh, translational research and how research affects alcohol policy is not necessarily one that uh, would be immediately obvious to medical personnel, but uh, it is very relevant. And I think you will uh, see that as uh, we go on and talk about what the World Health Organization is doing in the area of uh, alcohol policy. So uh, in 2010, the World Health Assembly, which consists of representatives from a, uh, I think 193 member nations of the United Nations, which are also part of the World Health Organization, uh, voted on a resolution called the Global Strategy to Reduce the Harmful Use of Alcohol. And this had been in the, in the makings for several years uh, based on the recognition that alcohol-related problems uh, are a major health issue in many countries, if not most countries of the world. And you here in New Zealand, particularly at this hospital, I suspect don't need to be reminded of that. Uh, alcohol affects almost 200 medical conditions, uh, chronic diseases like cancer and heart disease, as well as uh, acute health conditions, particularly uh, violence, injuries, accidents, and uh, uh, psychiatric problems. Yeah, this is it. Mm -hmm. So which one am I pushing? I'll press it for you. Okay. So uh, the global strategy uh, was developed through a collaboration process with member states. Uh, stakeholders were consulted, including the uh, alcohol industry, but especially non-governmental organizations that work in the health area, professional societies. And uh, it kind of represents a consensus of uh, the public health community, the scientific community, as to what can be done to deal with alcohol problems from a public health perspective, including the improvement of uh, medical services. Um, the objectives were to raise awareness of people in uh, WHO member states, strengthen the knowledge base by stimulating more research, uh, increased technical support that uh, WHO could give to governments and ministries of health in particular, and improve our systems for monitoring surveillance and information dissemination. Uh, as you know, uh, all uh, health conditions uh, are coded according to the international uh, classification of diseases. Uh, ICD-10 is being revised now, and there are new codes, but in many respects, alcohol-related injuries and alcohol-related uh, uh, diseases are not coded properly, and when they are taken into account, the burden of disease is huge. Uh, the global strategy covers 10 areas, and I'm gonna cover some of these areas in terms of what the research says is, uh, uh, what uh, can be done to reduce the burden of illness connected with alcohol. Certainly a health services response, uh, including treatment for alcohol dependence, but now more and more the management of, of hazardous and harmful drinking in uh, healthcare settings, uh, hospitals, emergency departments, um, uh, primary care practices has become a major uh, thrust of uh, the public health community to get people to change their drinking behavior early in their drinking careers so it doesn't go on to become more serious uh, forms of alcohol dependence. Community action is something that everybody can be involved in. Health professionals can be 
very persuasive in dealing with uh, changes in local policies and now in New Zealand where you have the uh, devolution or, uh, of uh, uh, decision making to the local councils for uh, alcohol uh, licensing and um, uh, distribution, uh, there is going to be a lot of attention to expert opinion about what should be done about it, uh, particularly closing hours. And uh, if you've ever been to, uh, well, uh, uh, I'm sure you, you're, do you have an ED here, emergency department? Uh, you know what happens uh, after 11 or 12 o'clock on a weekend night. Uh, drink driving policies and countermeasures are a, uh, a part of this strategy and there's uh, very good evidence that they are effective in reducing uh, morbidity and mortality from alcohol related traffic uh, <coughs> accidents. Uh, the availability of alcohol is a key issue that uh, can be regulated uh, in order to prevent alcohol-related problems. Marketing of alcoholic beverages is a, a almost a trillion dollar industry now internationally. And uh, uh, the strategy calls for uh, the attention of public health authorities to deal with the, uh, the harmful effects of alcohol marketing, particularly on young people. Pricing policies uh, are another lever that we have to control uh, uh, alcohol problems. And uh, we, uh, we can do a number of things like uh, 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 the informal market in some countries. And uh, certainly the health community can collect better statistics to appropriately document the problems connected with drinking. So there is a role for everybody in the global strategy. And uh, the major partners include non-governmental organizations, professional societies, uh, research institutions, and uh, what WHO calls the economic operators, the alcohol industry. That can range from local uh, shopkeepers and liquor store owners, uh, bar owners, uh, people who own liquor store chains and, and uh, pubs, and certainly the, the larger producers, the breweries and uh, the distilled spirits companies and the um, uh, wine industry. And more and more these industries have become concentrated in a smaller and smaller number of multinational organizations. So a lot of the beer brands and uh, the beverages that are marketed at young people, uh, while they might look like they're local brands, are actually uh, uh, developed, produced, market tested, and distributed by l large multinational corporations. The media has a role to play, and certainly civil society. Uh, the global situation for alcohol problems is concerning. It's uh, particularly in the developing countries where there have been dramatic increases in alcohol-related problems, in part because of the lack of proper uh, controls on, on, on alcohol. Uh, as the new marketing strategies are being directed at uh, countries with big markets, particularly youth markets, we're getting uh, increased alcohol consumption. Alcohol consumption is very prevalent uh, in most countries in immigrant and recent immigrant populations. Uh, and in many countries, there's a lack of appropriate controls. Uh, the industry is influencing policy uh, to liberalize trade practices, liberalize alcohol controls, permit uh, unregulated marketing. And so uh, the public health community and the medical community really uh, more and more are coming into contact with powerful industry sources that are advocating for policies that aren't conducive to evidence-based health practices. Uh, there's a, a lack of a strong voice from civil society, including many parts of the medical community uh, who could be much more persuasive if they uh, uh, really uh, became advocates for 
reasonable, rational, uh, effective alcohol policies. Uh, often uh, at the governmental level, there's a fear of the economic uh, implications of alcohol control. What, uh, what uh, would be the effect on the economy if people drank less? Uh, and as it turns out, uh, that question uh, can be answered through uh, studies uh, conducted by health economists, which indicate that alcohol uh, problems cost more than alcohol contributes to the general economy. So the medical costs of dealing with all of the injuries and all of the chronic diseases attributable to alcohol alone outweigh the revenues that are collected through excise taxes and, and uh, uh, the jobs that are created within the economy. And then when you factor in all of the social problems, fetal alcohol effects, uh, uh, the costs are enormous. So it's really not a major contributor to our economy uh, in most countries. And then we have this culture of excessive drinking and, and uh, resistance by the alcohol industry to effective policies. In New Zealand, uh, according to the last estimate that was uh, 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 used to estimate the burden of disease in uh, this country, there were an estimated 802 deaths attributed to alcohol in 2007, which is about 5.4% uh, percent of the mortality. Uh, thing, things haven't changed much through since 2007, so that number of deaths uh, may not look too concerning, but 5.2% of mortality is uh, a big chunk when you consider all the uh, different diseases uh, and other uh, uh, causes of mortality that it's competing with, primarily because it contributes to violence and homicides and injuries uh, like traffic accidents uh, connected with intoxication. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. Uh, the Maori population is uh, disproportionately affected. And uh, when people in New Zealand were asked uh, about uh, had they ever experienced a serious problem connected with their drinking uh, or the drink, uh, 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 about 20% said their social life had been affected, 14% uh, said their home life had been affected, 12% said they've had an injury some, at some point in their life connected with drinking, and the list goes on and on and on. on uh, uh, chronic diseases, we, we just uh, can't estimate that through survey procedures, but uh, it, is, uh, it ripples through the uh, uh, healthcare uh, system in terms of the uh, different types of problems that are attributed to alcohol, uh, including breast cancer in women, uh, cardiovascular disease. It's not 100% <coughs> attribution like we have in alcohol liver cirrhosis, but uh, a proportion of many what is now called non-communicable disease, diseases, a significant proportion is attributable to alcohol. So what do we know about the effectiveness of alcohol policies? Uh, I worked with a uh, group of international esper experts from about nine countries uh, to put together a book in 2003, which was uh, republished in a second edition in 2010 called Alcohol, No Ordinary Commodity. And the book was sponsored by the Pan American Health Organization in its second edition, uh, by the World Health Organization in Geneva in its first edition. And it basically reviewed the evidence for uh, uh, the effectiveness of different types of alcohol policies that would control epidemics of binge drinking as well as chronic disease uh, across national boundaries. So we were looking for research that might be applicable to uh, uh, people in many different countries, many different age groups and, and cultural backgrounds. And what it boils down to is a uh, 
a way of looking at alcohol problems which, uh, and the control of alcohol problems, which ranges from the more traditional measures that we have, like um, treatment for alcohol dependence or alcoholism, to early intervention in, in healthcare settings to screen for possible alcohol problems or vulnerability and provide uh, health education. So on the downstream level, we've got a number of interventions that seem to work pretty well with small numbers of heavy drinkers. And education and persuasion strategies are now a common part of what kids get in school through their health education to discourage them from getting too involved with alcohol or drugs. Uh, we have measures that modify the drinking context, like ch training bar owners uh, uh, and service personnel to not serve intoxicated patrons. Uh, and we have measures that now have been developed to manage uh, aggression in bar situations where you can negotiate with people and uh, do it in a way that uh, calms people down who are heavily intoxicated and tend to be violent. Drink driving countermeasures going up the scale from the individual level to the population level uh, have been very effective in reducing uh, especially late night traffic fatalities that are alcohol related. Uh, regulating alcohol promotion is controls on marketing, uh, pricing and taxation, and regulating physical uh, availability are at the population level. They apply to all people or to subgroups of people, closing hours for bars, for example, or uh, increasing excise taxes to make alcohol a little bit more expensive. When you use those levers combined with these others, uh, you can reduce the uh, uh, extent of alcohol problems significantly in a society. When you remove effective policies like doing nothing about alcohol taxes and allowing alcohol to become cheaper because uh, uh, prices are inflated and less tax money is being uh, uh, collected, and as disposable income increase, increases, people have more money, uh, they buy more alcohol. And the cheaper the alcohol, the more people drink. So there are lots of things that can be done uh, just to prevent the um, deterioration of effective policies. And in many countries, we've been going in the opposite direction, including New Zealand, with 24-hour closing, uh, 24 hour, I'm sorry, uh, opening hours where people can sell alcohol just about anywhere. And I, I guess that, uh, my guess is that 15 or 20 years ago, that was not the case in New Zealand as in many other countries. And when you uh, systematically reduce all of these controls uh, within a society, uh, as has happened in the UK, uh, you can release an epidemic of binge drinking. So what do we know about treatment and early intervention services? Uh, I'll go through these one by one to give you a, a, a sense of what the, the scientific literature indicates. Uh, there have been many studies of alcohol treatment following people for three months up to a few years with uh, control groups. And basically what we found is that exposure to just about any treatment is associated with significant reductions in alcohol use. So someone who is alcohol dependent, uh, who uh, has withdrawal symptoms and high tolerance and can't manage their life, they've lost control, uh, many of these people respond well to formal treatment, which uh, often now is delivered in outpatient settings, but if necessary, uh, residential detoxification. Uh, Clinically significant changes in drinking problems can follow from brief interventions. Brief interventions are not for alcoholics, they're for people at risk and for harmful drinkers. So somebody comes into the emergency department with uh, an injury that's alcohol related, might just have been out drinking that weekend, got drunk, but they're not gonna go into alcohol withdrawal. They, uh, their tolerance maybe is not that high. In fact, a lot of alcoholics can uh, 
uh, manage pretty well uh, because they have high tolerance levels. But people who have lower tolerance tend to have more accidents and injuries. So clinically significant changes for brief interventions in healthcare settings uh, can be effective. And what's happening now, in part because it's advocated by the World Health Organization, is that screening tests are being disseminated and patients in many different uh, sectors uh, of uh, our healthcare system, especially primary care, uh, are being screened for the level of drinking, uh, referred to treatment if necessary, but given a brief intervention uh, in a healthcare setting if they're considered to be at risk. Uh, we know that Alcoholics Anonymous and other health self-help programs are good for alcoholics and treatment system improvements by coordinating referral between uh, primary care and hospital settings into the specialized system can also help to manage people and get them uh, into appropriate levels of, of care. Early intervention, as I mentioned, uh, is a growing area of interest because it provides a, a kind of a public health approach to secondary prevention. So if somebody uh, is just getting drunk once in a while but experiences an accident or an injury and they're not alcohol dependent, they are in a reasonably good position to change their drinking behavior, particularly after a teachable moment like an alcohol-related injury. And since uh, 1980, uh, several hundred studies have been conducted on alcohol screening and brief intervention. We can reliably get information by patients both through lab tests, liver function tests, but, uh, and, and blood alcohol concentration, but uh, we can get very good information just by talking to patients in an empathic way. How much did you drink last night? How often do you drink this amount? How often do you drink more than six or, uh, drinks? Uh, do you have a drink in the morning? By asking those questions using standardized screening tests, we can uh, get a good estimate of whether somebody's at risk or they're an alcoholic. Uh, as it turns out, there are about uh, five to ten times more people at risk who would score positive on a screening test than who would score high enough to be considered a candidate for further diagnostic evaluation and referral to treatment for alcohol dependence. So the, the people under that tip of the iceberg, the large numbers of people who are at risk, are good candidates for health professionals to do just a little bit of counseling. And when that counseling is done, many, but not all, patients follow the advice to reduce drinking to non-hazardous levels. Uh, a lot of medical practitioners say, oh, I can't ask people about their drinking. They'll get insulted. And anyway, alcoholics can't control their drinking. There are two things wrong with that. Most of the patients you talk to who may have an alcohol-related problem are not alcoholics. And uh, you can talk to them. In fact, when you really talk to patients, they're surprised that their medical practitioners don't ask them about tobacco, don't ask them about alcohol, don't ask them about drugs because they know very well often that that's the reason while they're, that they've come to a healthcare professional. Uh, and if, even if they don't, many illnesses are related to alcohol. High blood pressure can drive uh, a, a significant proportion of the high blood pressure that patients uh, receive, depression, uh, uh, just a variety of things are related to alcohol. So uh, we've got national programs now in Brazil, in the US, in Europe, European countries that are disseminating these early intervention strategies in healthcare settings, including uh, there's a lot of interest here in New Zealand. What we find is that uh, simple advice and brief counseling, simple advice uh, would be uh, five minutes of advice after a quick screen to determine that somebody is not an alcoholic but an at-risk drinker, a hazardous drinker. And uh, when we did a study for the World Health Organization, we found and uh, we randomized uh, over 1,000 patients in 10 countries to either a control group that got screened but no intervention, 
uh, a simple advice group that got five minutes of uh, just talking with a nurse or a doctor about their drinking and a brief counseling group that got a half hour of counseling and a self-help book. Uh, six months later, there were uh, significant reductions in um, hazardous drinking. The control group uh, changed a little bit too, but uh, there were significant differences between the group that got simple advice and the control group and the group that got brief counseling. And what was interesting about this study was that there were no differences between the simple advice and the brief counseling group that suggested that if you're gonna do an intervention, you don't have to spend a lot of time. It's probably better to do more patients in a quick intervention. And if somebody uh, is uh, uh, a heavy drinker or a binge drinker, uh, just a few minutes of discussion is likely to work with 20 to 25% of the patients they will make an attempt to try to cut back on their drinking based on the advice they get uh, from a health professional. Education strategies like school-based alcohol education programs are a typical way that many communities respond to alcohol-related problems. Uh, if uh, somebody is killed in a traffic accident, particularly a young person, everybody becomes concerned, they want to do something, and the first thing that they think about is perhaps strengthening alcohol education in the schools. Uh, other education strategy include mass media campaigns, alcohol warning labels on bottles and cans and, and beverages, and uh, more comprehensive school programs. And what we found through a lot of randomized trials in a number of different countries is that information-based alcohol education programs tend to have a very small effect. Kids get some information from it. It may help to change their attitudes, but uh, there are rarely any long-term effects, even short-term effects on their drinking behavior. The age at which they start drinking, how much they drink once they start, the information uh, doesn't seem to have much of an impact on kids. What is needed is programs that involve parents and teachers that focus on, particularly on high-risk youth. So some kids are more vulnerable than others and they need more attention from their parents and teachers and not just education, but they need alternative things to do and um, uh, they need to be more engaged in the education process uh, in their schools so they don't become alienated from school and start gravitating to peer groups that are gonna get involved in alcohol and drugs. So that, those kinds of programs are rare in most countries. And what we conclude in reviewing the literature on alcohol education is that it's rarely effective in dealing with the problem alone. You need intensive programs, you need evidence-based programs, and um, uh, you need many other things that are much more effective if you're gonna invest resources in trying to control alcohol epidemics. Uh, modifying the drinking environment is another way that we can begin to uh, change uh, the way that uh, alcohol is used. Uh, some measures seek to change the environment by uh, going into bars and restaurants and changing and, and uh, uh, making sure that the personnel are adequately trained to deal with um, uh, the way they serve alcohol. That means making sure that the people purchasing alcohol are of the legal purchase age and that um, when they're uh, being served, uh, they're not serving intoxicated patrons. Often these simple rules are ignored. Underage people can buy alcohol in many uh, countries uh, through retail establishments or go into bars and uh, many people who are even visibly intoxicated continue to be served. Uh, we've also got good programs that uh, can help to deter aggression, but uh, again, that's uh, kind of not uh, going to solve our alcohol problems on the streets uh, when uh, so many people are either served excessive amounts of alcohol or can buy cheap alcohol in supermarkets and preload, get drunk, and uh, they cause a lot of problem for themselves and for others. 
drink driving countermeasures are another part of this armamentarium that it can be uh, assembled to deal with alcohol problems. And in many countries, I think Australia is one of the best examples, we can get uh, significant changes in long-term problem rates, particularly, as I mentioned, uh, late night traffic fatalities by, uh, ec by implementing evidence-based uh, 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 drink driving policies like random breath testing uh, and graduated licensing for novice drivers where uh, they uh, limit the conditions that they're able to drive until they mature enough to take responsibility. Uh, when uh, these measures have been evaluated through different types of research, uh, we can get some dramatic effects. Uh, here's uh, uh, traffic uh, casualties before and after a, um, uh, a, 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 a random breath testing program in the UK. And uh, the control uh, for this was commuting hours. Uh, the uh, uh, crackdown was started in 1967. And on weekend nights, uh, you got dramatic reductions in, in uh, late night, uh, in, in, uh, in traffic accidents as a function of uh, publicizing the, um, the uh, implementation of random breath testing. So uh, it's not necessarily that we need to punish people. It's not that we need even to stop every driver to check their blood alcohol level. What, uh, what is uh, done in these cases is just to publicize and increase the perception that uh, a, uh, an individual when they're driving might be controlled by the police and that reduces uh, people uh, getting intoxicated before they drive. Uh, alcohol marketing is a global industry. Uh, brands are advertised through TV and radio, print point of sale promotions, the internet and now social media. Uh, and uh, alcohol advertising has been found to predispose young people to begin drinking before the legal purchase age and to consume more alcohol when they drink. Uh, we've got different types of regulation. Uh, countries like Norway and France have total bans on advertising. Uh, some countries have partial bans, so uh, alcohol advertising can't be, uh, can't be broadcast at times when kids are likely to view it. Uh, sometimes the ban extends up until nine o'clock at night. And industry self-regulation is what the industry favors, and it's the predominant form of regulating alcohol marketing in many countries, including New Zealand. Uh, self-regulation codes uh, tend to be easily circumvented. Uh, a lot of uh, content is designed to appeal to young people and it's targeted at markets that appeal, uh, that where the, it's viewed by young people. Uh, and what we've concluded in looking at uh, the effects of alcohol marketing and how it encourages and, and facilitates uh, early initiation into uh, a drinking culture among young people is that a total ban is probably the best way to go. It certainly has been effective with tobacco. Uh, and I think uh, eventually we're going to see it not only for alcohol, but for also marketing uh, high sugar products uh, to children and young adults, uh, soda as well, uh, and other products that are uh, hazardous for young people. Uh, pricing and taxation is one of the more effective ways to drive down the rates of heavy drinking in a country. Uh, people increase their drinking when prices are lowered uh, and uh, they decrease their consumption when prices go up. Uh, increased taxes affect uh, 
adolescents and problem drinkers. Uh, they even affect alcoholics. Uh, so people make choices uh, often based on uh, the price they have to pay for a commodity. For alcohol, sometimes they switch to cheaper brands, but uh, that does not necessarily uh, uh, account for the, um, uh, the major impact of increasing the cost of alcohol. And uh, for the most part, pricing policies are very effective in controlling heavy drinking. Uh, happy hours, for example, where the price of alcohol is lowered or free drinks are provided, uh, are uh, a pricing strategy designed to get people to purchase more alcohol. They're a pricing strategy that uh, also get people drunk. And when you uh, don't have a happy hour, people can drink significantly less. So control on pricing policies through taxation and other things can uh, be very effective in reducing alcohol-related problems in a society. It's not just that it affects consumption, it affects, it affects heavy use, and some people consider it a tax on just uh, ordinary drinkers. But uh, for modest, uh, moderate drinkers, uh, the amount that's paid in an in, uh, because of a 5 or 10 percent increase in alcohol taxes is very small. The people who are paying most for it are the people who are drinking the most and therefore the ones who are most at risk. So it's actually quite fair in reducing the alcohol problems in the people who need it most. Uh, here's an example of a dramatic decline in alcohol-related disease mor mortality in the state of Alaska when in 1982 uh, the price of alcohol was raised. Uh, over time, probably due to inflation, alcohol-related mortality increased, and then in 2002 they raised the tax again and uh, alcohol-related mortality went down. So we've seen this in a number of countries, just simple changes in the tax rate can have an impact. And when you think about it, by not adjusting the price or the tax of alcohol on alcohol for inflation is a way of contributing to alcohol-related mortality in the population. So doing nothing is uh, doing a disservice to uh, the health of the population by just letting alcohol get cheaper and cheaper through inflation. Um, we can skip to the next one. Oh, I'm sorry, go back there. Regulating alcohol availability uh, is um, one of the most effective strategies that we have. And in New Zealand now, the uh, local control over hours of sale and uh, who's going to sell alcohol, supermarkets, liquor stores, uh, the opening hours of bars, can be controlled locally. What we found through extensive research in many countries is that restrictions on opening time, density of alcohol outlets can have large effects on consumption and problem rates. When you begin to concentrate outlets in a late night entertainment district, as you have in Auckland, uh, you're creating conditions that uh, bring large numbers of people together, often uh, disproportionately young people and young males uh, who are coming there to drink. They, it increases the opportunity, there's price competition, and uh, pretty soon you've got a serious problem uh, with uh, accidents and injuries and violence. And uh, that is a problem that uh, was in part created by zoning laws. Uh, so when it comes to local councils uh, trying to uh, control the rates of uh, drinking on weekends among young people, it's not a question of taking away a privilege that uh, they are entitled to. It's uh, correcting a problem that was created by bad government policy. Uh, this is uh, a study of homicide rates in Diadema, Brazil, before and after closing time regulation. Uh, 
uh, between 1995 and 2005. In 2002, uh, closing time regulation took effect. Diadema is a city in Brazil that had the highest homicide rate per capita of any city in the country. When uh, they decided to close the bars, uh, which could stay open until 4 o'clock in the morning, when they decided to close the bars at 11 o'clock at night, uh, over the course of a year or two, there were dramatic reductions in the homicide rates, dramatic reductions in uh, admissions to uh, shelters for women who were abused uh, usually on weekends uh, when their partners returned from heavy drinking. Um, that kind of dramatic effect uh, was uh, attributable to uh, a simple change in closing hours. And uh, when you think of the opposite, uh, when closing hours go from, let's say, closing at midnight or 12 uh, uh, or 1 o'clock to all night drinking, you're giving people uh, many more hours to continue drinking, to get drunk, and uh, to have uh, uh, serious uh, problems, usually interpersonal problems, uh, but health problems connected with their drinking. So we've got some of these levers that were put into the uh, policies that uh, communities have, that countries have. Uh, these policies didn't, uh, weren't created by accident. They were created for a public health purpose, but we tend to forget the public health purpose. And um, uh, when they're changed, they're usually changed because somebody's trying to make more money selling alcohol. But there's a price that we all pay for that. Uh, in Diadema, uh, that amounted to uh, a reduction of nine homicides a month. Um, regulating availability through a minimum purchase age. I was here in New Zealand a few years ago, and they were considering raising the drinking age, I think, to 20 for um, off-premise purchases that did not go through. In 1984, uh, a national minimum purchase age was uh, uh, implemented in the US, mainly through pressure from the federal government. And over the next 15 years, one state after the other uh, changed their minimum purchase age, uh, or they risked losing federal funds for, uh, that came from highway taxes. After the implementation of the minimum purchase age in the states, uh, we observed a dramatic decline in traffic fatalities. But the research is still coming in from that period. And it had beneficial effects on a variety of different areas of public health for young people, particularly kids who grew up in states uh, when uh, this uh, reduced uh, the increase in the drinking age was implemented, were much less likely to go on to become alcohol dependents later in life. There's a formative period which is similar to what happens with tobacco. If you can protect kids uh, from getting started in using these products between the ages of, let's say, 14 and 21, if you can go up to 24, it's even better, uh, insulate them. Uh, they don't start afterwards. And uh, kids who, when they raised the purchase age for tobacco from 18 to 21, uh, we found major reductions in the onset of nicotine dependence because kids learn how to smoke when they're in their late teens. And the same thing happens for alcohol. So there are lots of beneficial effects by raising the alcohol purchase age. So what we've learned is that there are a number of best practices that a country can use, uh, a community can use. Uh, the low cost best practices are minimum legal purchase age going from, uh, let's say, 18 to 20 or 21. 
Uh, some countries have government monopolies which allow them to control availability uh, and uh, taxes and pricing, uh, but licensing can also accomplish that uh, through restrictions on hours and days of sale and outlet density, alcohol taxes, and lowering the alcohol strength of alcoholic beverages. Uh, more expensive is random breath testing and drunk driving uh, countermeasures. Uh, including lowering the BAC limits. It has to be enforced. Uh, New Zealand is relatively high compared to other countries. In terms of 0.08, it could come down uh, and save more lives if it were 0.05. Uh, suspending licenses for young people involved in alcohol-related traffic crashes and other infractions, and uh, brief interventions in treatment in healthcare settings. They're more expensive, but they're cost effective. What we've learned in general is that there are a number of different ways to control availability. Uh, it's not just physical availability, availability uh, which kind of prevents people from drinking too much, uh, but allows just about everybody else to drink moderately. Uh, economic availability through pricing and tax controls, social availability through uh, re restrictions on the drinking context to stop people from getting intoxicated, deterrence and social pressure, that works best for drinking and driving, and uh, reducing psychological availability through marketing restrictions. All of these things uh, can have a powerful effect on the rates of people who have alcohol problems, the number of alcohol-related injuries coming into an emergency department or an internal medicine department for chronic drinking problems. Uh, finally, the policy-making process is something that we in the health professions should be concerned about. Uh, this is not just uh, an issue that we need to leave uh, to the local chapter of uh, Mothers Against Drunk Driving or some other group. It's, I think, a responsibility of the health professions to become more involved in um, working with government officials uh, to uh, affect policymakers to implement policies that are based on sound evidence. And this gets us back to the WHO global strategy, there's a role for everybody in civil society and professional associations and individual practitioners who are experts uh, at, uh, on health issues are in a good position to advocate for sensible alcohol policies and to influence policymakers. Uh, the alcohol industry uh, is uh, uh, very cognizant of what seems to drive alcohol consumption, particularly in young people. They spend billions of dollars targeting young people, and uh, they cannot be blameless in terms of having an impact, particularly when you see the way that uh, sensible, effective alcohol controls can be systematically dismantled in a country. It's happened in New Zealand, it's happened in the UK, it's happened in another, uh, a num number of other countries. On the other hand, when you can implement these policies and correct the damage that has been done, you can reverse an epidemic. But the alcohol industry is gonna be against these things. So alcohol problems can be minimized and prevented using a coordinating, coordinated approach. Uh, those that limit availability, economic, social, uh, physical availability, and um, uh, psychological availability are the most effective. Uh, regulating affordability, physical availability, and alcohol promotion are probably the best buys. And effective interventions are also available that are cost effective. So, Thank you for your attention. That's kind of the story of where the World Health Organization is going through its global strategy, trying to get governments to adopt more rational, reasonable policies to control alcohol-related problems. Thank you.